Thank you. I'd like to appreciate the invitation and the opportunity to talk to uh, colleagues uh, at all levels, uh, from medical student to chairman of uh, Higher Education Commission. Uh, in the interest of time, if I don't take too much in the preliminaries and go directly to my presentation, I hope that will be acceptable. So I just like to share my screen. And I would be grateful if you could confirm whether the screen is visible to you and you can see my slides. Could somebody confirm that? Uh, it's OK, Dr. Khalid. It's OK. OK, thank you. It's OK. So, I, yeah, it's OK. Welcome. Thank you. So I continue with my uh, presentation. The idea is to talk about how to get research published. Uh, I've constructed this uh, presentation in four sections. Number one, dealing with title, abstract and introduction, then with tables and figures, and then writing a discussion and conclusion. And finally, Almost never you get a paper accepted without comments from peer reviewers. So it's important to understand how to handle the comments given by peer reviewers. The idea is that this cycle. Where we submit a paper, it gets reviewed. It's revised or rejected. And then you have to resubmit and type keeps moving on. Uh, through this presentation, I'd like you to be able to understand how the time machine works rather than just look at the output of the time machine. So we'll talk about how the process of uh, assessment of a paper works and how as authors we should prepare to deal with it. Before that, I briefly give you an outline of my own career. In 1983, I joined medical school in Karachi. And on finishing medical school, I spent some time working in Kenya uh, as uh, a junior doctor. On returning from Kenya, I had the opportunity to first publish my first paper. And uh, that was now almost 30 years ago. A few years later, after completing my fellowship of the College of Physicians and Surgeons, I moved to Canada where I learned about research methods at McMaster University. And from there I moved to uh, the UK where I published my first systematic review. And since that time, over the 25 years, I have uh, edited various journals, written a book about how to perform meta-analysis. I have been chief editor of the British Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology. And uh, here is a, a list of the number of citations per year of my papers. And I've had the opportunity to travel the world presenting my work on research as well as on how to do research. But the most important feature of uh, my career is presented in this uh, orange line. It shows the total number of participants whose data has been analyzed in my publications. And you can see that this number is reaching nearly a million. And without the contribution of uh, data by patients, none of my 400 publications would have been possible. So it is important to recognize that the most important player in research is not the author, not the ethics committee, not the editor, not the peer reviewer, it's actually the patients who provide the data. We'll now move on to our first section of the webinar, which is writing 
titles, abstract, and introduction. Before I go on to the topic directly, it's important to understand what is a journal made of? So primarily, the journal has an owner. It could be a university, a society, or a commercial organization. The owner collaborates with or appoints a publisher. This could be a publishing company. It could also be the owner themselves. And important to understand that distinction between the two roles, the owner and the publisher. We'll come back to the publisher in a second. The owner primarily appoints a chief editor and some journal staff. Once these are appointed, the idea is that through this dotted line, the owner should no longer play a role in what happens in the running of the day to day work of the journal. The editor would appoint an editorial board and editors. And the editorial board would work under the rules set by various uh, organizations. For example, the International Committee of Medical Journal Editors or Committee of Publication Ethics. And in Pakistan also the rules and regulations set by Higher Education Commission and the Medical and Dental Council. And working under these regulations, there is a strategy developed by the journal under which the editors assess the papers submitted to the journal to accept and reject materials, uh, usually within the confines of a peer review process that is independent. And once this content is ready, this is the time when the publisher comes into play and the journal is produced where papers are compiled into an issue. So if you think about it, the publisher only has a role in compiling the issue of the journal. The real role of assessing what is good science what should be accepted, what should be rejected, what should be improved and accepted. All of that lies with the chief editor, editorial board and editors. And authors have to deal with the system they have set up in order for their papers to be accepted. Here is the website of the International Committee of Medical Journal Editors and that of the Committee of publication ethics. And saying a few words about journals, there are different types of journals, including open access journals. But beware that there are also predatory journals and a whole list of these journals is available on this website that analyzes. So don't get fooled. Uh, don't get yourself entangled in a trap where people want to extract money from you. Clearly, there is a need for investment in order to prepare and produce journals, uh, but this should be within a proper framework. So coming back to what is a journal, here is uh, an example of the British Journal where I was the chief editor. This journal had four senior editors, 36 editors from various countries, and trainee editors. And their role was to assess around 1,600 papers annually, of which 88% of papers were rejected. So the key thing is to recognize that the most common outcome following submission in an international journal would be rejection. The purpose of this webinar is to present to you ideas that allow you to avoid rejection. So the most important thing to understand is that the people who make decisions about exception, acceptance or rejection are human beings. And their opinion is both scientific and personal. Authors may think 
that their audience, their readers are clinicians, but actually their first reader is the editor. So if the author cannot convince the editor, they cannot reach the clinician. So we need to get to know the editors. That's the most important first step when we are planning a scientific project or planning writing of our scientific work. Peer reviewers and editors hate chopping of data into many multiple papers when one or two would have been the ideal outcome of a large data set. They don't like claiming that the findings are unexpected or the first demonstration because it is unlikely in the modern world where research is happening in all different countries that our research produces the first unexpected finding. And most of all, editors and peer reviewers don't like cheating on behalf of researchers. So be honest and be truthful. And with this, avoid inappropriate acts in publication. I list some of them here. Plagiarism, duplication, salami, falsification. Here are the different definitions. The bottom line is if these faults underpin a research project there can be sanction there can be checking which will pick up these problems and once these problems are picked up and it is discovered that the paper submitted is actually fake news not true science then a process exists through which sanctions can be applied on authors and research teams so with this warning, we move on to what is the first myth that peer reviewers reject my papers? Well, this is not true because ahead of peer reviewers are editors who can reject the paper without a review. So the idea is to avoid rejection at the first assessment by the editor. Remember, if a paper is rejected, it has the chance that it will be rejected again. So the idea is to get it right the first time. So I take you through the life cycle of a publication. Here is an idea conceived in 1996. Then protocol is developed, ethics approval is obtained, recruitment happens, patients are followed up. It takes nearly 10 years and then we are ready for write up of our scientific project. It will then be submitted and published. And this will take a few more years. So a lot of patience is required on part of good scientific teams. This is the outcome of this process, a paper published in the Journal of American Medical Association. We want that our paper when submitted as a word file is converted into a PDF publication as soon as possible. We want to hear this news from the editor. We are almost ready to accept your paper. We are pleased to accept your manuscript. Your paper will be online within seven to ten days. These messages do not arrive in your inbox unless you have done due diligence in your research and have focused effort in writing and presenting it in a manner that is easy for editors to accept. Editors want that when a paper is published, it is accepted by clinicians as science and is used to improve patient-centered research. And this is called evidence-based medicine. So these are the few steps of evidence-based medicine. Formulate a clear question, find the literature, appraise the science, and use this for practice. Journals actually curate the evidence for use in evidence-based medicine. And the usual paper structure is title 
abstract introduction, methods, results, discussion, and various other things. And don't forget figures and tables. Initially, the editors look at these three things. So if these three things have some problem, it's possible that the paper will be rejected without peer review. So what do or when do audit authors write the abstract? My experience is that in the cycle of publication from identifying a clinical problem to converting into a research question, study design, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, in these various steps, authors write the title and the abstract right at the end on the time of submission. Whereas they have the opportunity to write the abstract when they write the protocol. They also have the opportunity when they register their study and when they start to write their manuscript. So please don't delay the process of writing the abstract and the title right to the end. Abstract should be structured. It should be able to stand alone, should avoid abbreviations and should follow the instructions of the journal. To help you understand the process of getting there, I present to you a question. In this picture, if this is a research project and the question is, is the driver a man or a woman? It has participants, intervention and exposure and outcomes. So the participants are people who are driving this type of car. The exposure is different types of pattern of filling petrol in the car. The reference standard is determining the gender of the driver. And finally, what should be our study design? So these three or four or five things, participants, intervention and outcome are really important to include in your title. So to put man on the moon required millions of dollars and thousands of individuals. <clears throat> but the publication of the announcement of this research project was in just three words on the moon. You need a headline that attracts your researcher. Only then they will go on to read the subheading and then the rest of the text. And as you can see in this picture, the text is not even readable. So please pay attention to getting the title right because if the title is not read or is boring or is not attractive, then the text of the paper will not be read. So think of the title as being written in just 100 characters. It need to be specific and it need to focus on the components I mentioned earlier, participants, intervention and outcomes, as well as study design. Because nowadays, Articles are published online. It need to be picked up by search engines. So when somebody searches your article in Google, the Google search engine should be able to pick it up quickly. And remember, the Google search engine would look for the title and the abstract first before it would look at anything else in the article. Preferably, do not include question marks or abbreviations in your title and comply with the instructions of the journal and reporting guidelines when preparing title. So here I give you an example of the title used in the project I showed you a moment ago. Here we have the study design presented as a subtitle and here we have the intervention presented in the title and the outcome presented in the title. So you can see that using these three important elements helps us present our work in a manner that can create an impact and can be searched by the robot or the crawlers used by search engines. 
we now move to the abstract. It need to have its objected presented as participants, intervention and outcomes. And this objective will also then be presented in the introduction. So focus on these three or four elements of your research question. The study design will also need to be presented in the abstract and repeated in the introduction. Here is an abstract submitted. It looks good. But when edited, many errors are identified and corrected. If these errors are found to be serious by editors and peer reviewers, they are not going to read your introduction and the rest of the paper to make their decision. They will reject your paper without the need for reading the rest of what you have written. So it's very important for me to highlight that uh, Avoiding rejection requires you to focus on your title and your abstract. If your abstract is accepted, only then your introduction will be read. Only then your methods and results will be read. Only then your discussion will be read. So pay attention to detail. Follow the guidelines for publication published, for example, in this website called Equator. And these guidelines, for example, require you to publish your title, register your title, your protocol, etc. And they also tell you how to summarize your title and abstract when, when preparing your manuscript. So use these existing instructions. Remember that writing a scientific paper is not creative writing. We are not writing a novel. We are writing a piece of science for which. The process and structure is extremely formulaic, and if we don't follow the formula, our paper will just not be accepted. So in the title, you can see that they are asking you to identify various elements, and it's important that these elements are included. So for example, in the consort checklist, in the strobe checklist, these items are already identified for you. For example, in the Prisma checklist, if you are publishing a meta-analysis, they ask you to include the term systematic review or meta-analysis inside your title. This is what I talked about, title and abstract, but nowadays, it is also expected that you produce a video abstract. So I'm not going to show you one just now, but be, aware, be mindful that going forward, you will be expected to present a 60 second to 90 second short video as an abstract of your scientific work. So we talked about objective, putting objective and design in the last paragraph of introduction. How do we write the introduction? In my opinion, it should be in three paragraphs, a brief, brief background. The background can be identified by carrying out a search using a search filter in PubMed. So if you're writing about diabetes and you want to report randomized trials, why not only use a systematic review of randomized trials and with this, you can get your brief background. And then you need to report what is deficient in the existing studies on your topic. Here it is important to highlight what are the weaknesses of previously published studies. So here I give you an example of a topic where we are preparing a paper. It is a cohort study. We have prepared this title. And when we do the search, we identify that somebody has already carried out a systematic review on this topic. The author would normally become quite depressed that my work has already been done and published many times over, not only that, but only also summarized in a systematic review. How to deal with this situation? Well, you read the limitations of the study 
written in the discussion inside this systematic review. And you will find that they already say that the existing studies have biases in design and problems with respect to publication bias and heterogeneity. You can use this information to put inside the second paragraph of your introduction. So use the material written as weakness or limitation of study in previously published papers to include in your second paragraph of the introduction. With this formula where you use previously systematic review to write the background and the limitations of the previously published papers to write the second paragraph of your introduction, you will immediately have a justification for your own study and to justify the need for its objective. At this stage, may I ask if what I presented was clear and if uh, I can proceed to the next stage of my presentation? Yes, sir, it was very interesting and uh... We are really enjoying it, so you can proceed. OK, thank you very much. So for the rest of the presentation, I realize that we are running a little bit behind time, so I will go through it quickly and will very happily take questions uh, so that if anything needs to be clarified, I can return to my slides in the question time. So just to set the scene again as an editor, once I read the title, and the abstract, and I'm convinced that this is a good paper for my journal. I would like to read the introduction to know that, yes, this paper has a justification. Uh, once I'm convinced that this paper has a justification, I want to very quickly look at the data. For this, I, I am not going to look at the results section. I will jump to the figures and the tables. So it is important that once authors have prepared introduction and abstract, they focus on getting the tables and figures right. As I said, the journals curate the evidence for evidence-based medicine and the evidence in evidence-based medicine is in this structure of the paper. And after the initial assessment, the evidence is in fact contained in the figures and the tables. This concept is very important to understand because the evidence is only interpreted in the words and sentences and paragraphs of the text by the author. The evidence actually resides or sits inside the fig figures and the tables. So we've got to get them right. So here you see that the table can be presented not just uh, vertically, but also horizontally. So information present can be presented in any manner. And nowadays, because we don't just read paper, we read stuff on computer screen. We can move around on the screen to see even quite complex information inside a table. Remember that the table should be able to be stand alone. And if necessary, it should repeat any methods and references so that when somebody is looking at the table, they don't have to refer to the text in order to understand what is presented. So I'll give you an example of how this is done. So here is the table. You can see that the source of inf information or evidence is highlighted in the footnote. You can also see that the scale used for presenting the star system for quality is also explained in the footnote. So when I read this type of a table with footnotes making things clear, I don't need to revert back to the method section. Here we look at a figure. It gives information. Uh, it's often said that a picture tells a story far more quickly than a thousand words can. And this is also true for scientific figures. In this figure, we can tell 
that there is a group which has looked at tables and there is another group that has examined graphs made of information, the same information that's presented in the tables. And we can see that. Sir, it's, uh, I'm sorry, sir, I'm interrupting, interrupting you. Can I ask a question? Please, please go ahead. Uh, sir, you are uh, telling us about the tables and figures. Uh, so many of the reviewers uh, used to say that uh, uh, don't repeat your data in uh, tables and figures. If you have presented that data in your results section, then don't repeat it in your tables. So what do you okay, uh, I, advise us in this regard? Okay. I, I agree with that completely. But for this, it is very important that your figure is completely self-explanatory. So for okay. example, in this, in this figure, and I'll give you some more information about that in a second. In this figure, we want to see that the people reading the table are taking a longer time. So this black bar is showing the time taken by these people who are randomized to receive information in the table. So they have taken 700 seconds in this case to read the table. The same information has been read in a figure containing exactly the same information in only 400 seconds. So you can see that it takes longer to read a table than a figure. Yes. The, second, the second more important thing is that the accuracy of the information when presented in a figure is equally interpreted correctly. So, the, so you have taken shorter time, but the accuracy of interpretation has not been compromised. So I encourage you to present your information in figures as much as possible. Uh, sir, but, uh, sir, sorry, I'm interrupting you again. So can you share your screen again? Uh, is there a problem? Uh, I, yes, I apologize sir. if I have uh, missed out on sharing. I apologize for that. I start sharing one more time. How is that? Can you see my screen now? Yes, sir. Uh, sorry. Uh, th thank you for uh, thank you for highlighting uh, this problem. Let me just go back to my presentation with the full screen. Can you now see the full screen? Yes, sir, we can see. You can proceed, sir. Thank you. Uh, so let's just look at the instructions on how to prepare a figure. Now you will note when you search the literature on Google, that you will not find these papers easily. <clears throat> so here is a paper uh, which gives information on how to construct graphs. It highlights that the caption should be completely clear. It explains that all the symbols and abbreviations should be defined, that three-dimensional graphs are confusing and should be avoided. And with this, I move on to talk a bit more about figures. So here is a figure I have used in my own publication concerning. I could easily have presented this information as a table. But for this figure, I have described. What is the short form for RCT? And I have used bars, but within bars, I have given the actual numbers. So I have explained that numbers within the bars represent the number of studies. So it is possible for the reader to see that in this systematic review, there are 22 studies of which adequate randomization is reported in 19. And that 19 forms more than 80% of the total number of papers in this systematic review. So this figure will be more easily read and understood by uh, readers as compared to a table. 
From figures and tables, we now move on to methods and results. I don't want to take too much time here except to say that these methods and results tell us whether a study is valid or not. And then the results tell us what the results are. And figures and tables are the most important key part of the results. And the footnotes of the figures and tables which give the methods are the key part of the methods. I take you to the story of a paper. It is submitted on the 12th of September in 2005. After initial assessment, it is immediately rejected because it does not comply with the instructions of the journal. It is revised and resubmitted. Four days are wasted. After this resubmission, it is sent for peer review and it is possible that some peer reviewers will re recommend rejection. Some will accept and maybe there will be split decision between different peer reviewers. The peer reviewers will use checklists like the consort checklist for randomized trial to make their judgment. And they will look at how you have reported outcome sample size, etc. Here is a simple example of a study. And a figure can report how patients have been followed up in a study. So for example, 200 patients have been randomized into control and intervention. And it's possible to give whether patients have been lost or not in a figure. And this type of figure is nowadays considered mandatory in almost all studies. From these figures, it is even possible to compute the result directly. And I'll show you an example. So here in a study amongst 100 people who were given intervention and these people suffered infertility, 25 people became pregnant on follow up. In the control group, only 10 people became pregnant. If we all of this information is reported in a figure, it is possible for me to know how effective the intervention is. So for this, I take you through calculation, which I will do extremely quickly. I pick up the outcomes and put them at the top. And the intervention and control on this side of the table. And I take the number 25 and it goes in cell A and the total goes over there. And for the outcome, the 10 goes in the cell C and the total goes over there and it looks like this. So you can see that from a figure, even inside my own head as an editor, I can very quickly compute this table. And then I can calculate that the rate of pregnancy amongst the intervention group is 25% and that in the control group is 10%. And from this, I can compute the relative risk of 2.5. So from this, you can see that from a figure, it was possible for me to immediately see without the need for detailed calculation that the intervention is two and a half times more effective than control. So please use figures to describe your methods as well as your results. So here is an example of a published paper demonstrating all of this information inside one figure. So you have your methods and your results combined inside a figure. Here is another paper that combines this information in a figure and presents the overall summary of this in the text of the results section. So I hope from this you can see how figures and tables can be constructed and used to present in a manner that is immediately and quickly understood by peer reviewers and editors. At this time, can I ask again if my presentation so far has gone well and I can continue? Uh, yes, sir, it is going very well. You can continue. Thank you. OK, one of the things that people complain to me about a lot is that we find it very hard to write discussion and conclusion. Is this correct? Sometimes it happens that uh, we find in writing discussion. Okay, 
Also, I notice that people write the discussion very long. And they spend a lot of time on the discussion. My advice is to spend that time on writing the abstract and make your discussion very short. And the discussion should be structured. So my suggestion is that because the discussion is mainly about understanding how the results will help in caring for patients, this information goes in the discussion. We should focus on very quickly telling the people whether our results are valid. And this can be done by constructing the discussion into these subheadings. We write the main findings. We write the strengths and weaknesses. Once we know the main finding and strength and weaknesses, we know whether the results are valid. And we can say what our results are by taking the text from the abstract and putting that into the main findings of the discussion. And what we can do is in the abstract, our results section has numbers. We can remove those numbers and then only the words, sentences and paragraphs can describe the main findings. So I'll give you an example. Here is a paper, the title of the paper. This is the result section of this paper as written in the abstract. So it says that there are 75 articles of which 51 have the null hypothesis, etc. prospectively registered. For the discussion, we can say the same thing 51 of 75, instead of saying this number with 68% and confidence interval, we can simply say two thirds of the papers were prospectively registered. So you can see how we have converted numbers into words which can go into the main findings paragraph of the discussion section. Here I highlight this point again. Numbers can be easily converted into words from abstract into discussion. Another example, in this case, 61% of the prospectively registered papers had a particular feature. And we can simply say this information by saying over half of the papers did not meet the target sample size here. I hope this point is clear that numbers from abstract should be converted into words to write the first paragraph of the discussion. Please do not make any claims that your work is original or the first report, because typically. If you say that it is the first report, it is because you have not done a search properly. OK, then. The conclusion part of the discussion can also be based on the conclusion part of the abstract. So in this paper, here is the conclusion. Women participating in trials experience better outcomes. We can use the same text and add a few more sentences explaining the same feature with a bit more description, and that becomes your conclusion of the discussion. So now we have written the main findings and the conclusion of the discussion. We now have only three more paragraphs to write strengths and weaknesses, comparison with previous studies and implications of the findings. Remember, in the introduction we wrote what were the weaknesses of the previous studies. We use the same references. And we write these references in the third paragraph of the discussion to compare our main finding with the findings of the previous studies. And then we have our third paragraph of the discussion. We now are left with only two paragraphs to write the strengths and weaknesses. For writing this paragraph, remember statistics is not the main thing. The main thing is whether you use randomization, whether the outcome was complete, whether you use multivariable model, 
So your methods described here as strengths and weaknesses are the key part of the second paragraph of your discussion. So I show you an example. In this flow diagram that we discussed how a study is constructed, you can have selection bias, which applies in the beginning of the figure. You can have performance bias, which applies in the middle of the figure, or you can have measurement bias, which applies in the end of the figure. And these are the features that you can cover in writing your second paragraph of the discussion, whether or not there was concealment, blinding, and completeness of follow up. And here are some other words to describe the same concept. And with these concepts, referring back to your figure, describing your study and your data, it is possible for you to write about 10 to 20 lines concerning strengths and weaknesses of your paper. I give you an example of how to write limitation. The important thing is to write your limitation with a positive ending. So here is a text from one of my students who, write, who, who wrote the first draft saying, our study has some limitations, most of them related to the subjective nature of the topic we were addressing. So in this sentence, you can see that we are saying for our paper that we have limitations and the nature is subjective. This conveys a negative impression to the reader or the editor. You can convert this into a positive feature by saying that these subjective nature of the topic is a perceived limitation, not a real limitation. And that this perceived limitation, you have tackled it by using strong methods, by using duplicate data extraction, so that two people were looking at the same piece of information in order to avoid subjectivity. So here you can see that we have highlighted the limitation, but have referred to our methods to state that we have dealt with the limitation. So that's a positive ending. Another example, we are stating that there was no instrument available, and this was a complex process. We can also convert this to a positive finding, as stated here. Is there, is there a question or a comment? No, sir, you can continue. OK, thank you. So with this uh, background, I have now highlighted how you can write the main findings, conclusion, comparison with other studies, and strengths and weaknesses from using the information you already have. The final is the meaning of the findings or the interpretation of the findings. And this tells you whether the findings are useful for patients. Writing this is fairly complex. And I simply highlight that you should consider re-emphasizing the strength of your paper and re-emphasize the comparison of your findings. And then with that, you can use the results, the conclusion, and with this, you have all the different five paragraphs written for your discussion section. In the interest of time, I can stop here. I was going to cover how to write a response to peer reviewers. If you think that I should continue, I can continue with describing response to peer reviewers. No, or I can I my presentation. Me know. Uh, Dr. Khalid, uh, I'm really uh, thankful. It's really very interesting. And uh, all of us, uh, particularly those who are uh, interested here, uh, sorry, uh, people wish that you should continue. But uh, unfortunately, due to shortage of time, and uh, we are getting late. So we can have another session next time. Yes. Exclusively on these uh, problems in uh, getting response to the peer reviewers. 
or uh, that uh, that will be a separate session inshallah okay i'm happy with that so i will bring the presentation to closure by simply taking you to to the to the to the end of my presentation where i would like to highlight that i would like to highlight one important slide this is a letter of rejection written to einstein about his theory of relativity so if your paper is rejected please don't become depressed it basically means that you have joined the club of the most intellectual humans in the world even einstein's theory of relativity was rejected when first submitted and my advice to you is to stay calm to not become emotional to write the abstract and structured discussion to avoid the things that editors don't like to stay brief to revise and to keep resubmit your paper until your paper is accepted and in order to facilitate this i have established a facebook page called health education research and a lot of what i have presented is available as advice in the in my posts in facebook and you can go to this page in order to comment and ask me any questions uh, for my comments and response and i'll stop thank here thank you very much thank you very much dr khan so we shall be winding up the question answer session because of uh, shortage of time and inshallah uh, we shall have another session we wish we shall continue with you at uh, at length inshallah in uh, the, not one session but